How's it going? Necrotic Nick. And Jam and John here. With Raw's Metal. And we decided to do what were the 10 albums that got them into death metal. So we wanted to do that one because it's generally just a fun discussion. I guess I will start. Uh, a great place to start and probably, probably legitimately one of the first heavier albums that got me really into exploring... Uh, more extreme music like I mean I've always been a, a Pantera fan and and you know Slayer and Sepultura and the, you know the staples of things but then but then I, I started to branch out a little bit and wanted to see what else was out there and the band that first got me into more extreme music was the first Slipknot album um, some people will state that this is self-titled uh, I will state that it's also known as 870-621-345 regardless this album kicked nuts back in the day, um, and still does to this day. I still like jamming it. Songs like Surfacing, Spit It Out, um, Purity. That will always be probably my number one favorite Slipknot song. And I or you could almost argue it was like a fucking grindcore song. Yep, yep. I, I jammed this record over and over and over again. In fact, I, I even went so far as to tattoo the logo on my arm. Not important. <laughs> <laughs> and it's definitely a catalyst to what got me started into much more heavy extreme music. So, Nick, have at it. Well, uh, we started off at different points. Like, I got into more early old school death metal. And this was one, minor alphabetized, by the way, um, because I'm anal retentive like that. Broken <laughs> Hope's Loathing. I remember seeing ads for this in old magazines like Metal Maniacs. Uh, when that was still around, and I just loved this fucking weird, gross cover. So I picked it up and ended up really getting into it. And at that point, I was already into Cannibal Corpse, and this is not very far removed. This might be kind of proto brutal death metal because he had uh, the frontman had a very low register, not unlike Chris Barnes, but it was definitely a little bit chuggier. And this one, a little bit more melody and groove, but this, this definitely. Got his claws on me, and I started getting I have a burned copy of that album. Somebody a, somebody came into a gas station I was working at years ago and gave me a burned copy of that album. Dude, it's a killer <laughs> album. I just jammed this again recently. It still holds up. <laughs> All right. Since I apparently am not anal retentive and just grabbed 10 of these CDs and didn't put them in alphabetical order because I'm a fucking savage. This is just chaos, dude. Dying Fuck. fetuses stop at nothing. So back long before the internet was popular and, and when we were into giving our computers viruses, there was a, a thing called Bear Share. And beyond Bear Share, then next came LimeWire. And then MySpace became popular. And around that time is when I started really exploring for music and Dying Fetus came up as a recommendation on MySpace. And instantaneously, this, I was like, oh my god, this is heavier than balls. I need to, to really keep going, keep jamming. Songs like One Shot, One Kill, yeah. <laughs> Forced Elimination, Onslaught of Malice. This was such a, a great album. This is back when uh, I think Kevin Talley was still playing drums yep. for these guys at this point on this album. I, no, I, I, th th I think Nether didn't left at that point. Yep, yep. But yeah, th this record was great. Heavy, brutal, fast, and this got me going. Back in the 90s, I saw a movie called Ace Ventura, and we all know where this conversation is going to go. It's going to go right back to Cannibal Fucking Corpse. This was the first Cannibal Corpse album I ever picked up. Didn't get the song I was looking for in, you know, Ace Ventura, but I found a lot of great ones in Scattered Brains, Splattered, uh, sorry, Scattered Remains, Splattered Brains, duh, Born in a Casket. You can't go to a Cannibal Corpse show without hearing Skull Full of Maggots. That's a fucking live staple. This is still a really good album. I mean, it's not my favorite one by far now, but this definitely got me into this wild fucking genre and definitely got me into the whole horror themed music well before even like death did. So this is still integral in my growing up as a metalhead. Next in line for me, Burnt by the Sun's soundtrack to the, the personal, personal revolution. revolution. Yeah. So uh, for a long time I was into to hardcore bands, you know, Hatebreed, 
Caliban, I guess you'd call those hardcore bands. Yeah, that was like Caliban, I think, was in the in metalcore. Anyway, I picked up this album based on the recommendation from a, a good friend of mine at the time. He says, if you want something a little bit heavier, uh, a little bit more crazy, check out Burn by the Sun. And I, I remember I went out and I picked up the CD and I turned around and I, I looked at the titles on the back. And then I thought, this must be a pretty killer album based on the titles alone. I thought, I thought, you know what, even if I don't like the music, the, the song titles are good enough. Dow we're, Jones, we're, The Temple of Doom. Dow That's Jones, The Temple of Doom. Uh, Shooter McGavin. Boston, Boston Tea Bag Party, <laughs> Shooter McGavin. A song called Don Knotts. <laughs> I, I have an 8x10 black and white photo on my living room wall of Don Knotts. Back when I think math metal was becoming a big thing, these guys, in my opinion, were kind of the forerunners of really awesome math metal. They're definitely a, a lot of heavy. There's some there's some blast beat moments in here. Definitely polyrhythms. It was uh, a real chuggy group. Yep, too. real chuggy, real groovy. I've jammed this record again quite a bit, and it was because of bands like this that I was really curious to know what else music held, um, and definitely got me to explore more in defining heavier music. But the, when I heard this record, I thought, well, okay, this is pretty heavy, so I'm going to continue forward and see what's out there. I love the shit out of this album. Pretty much about a week after I bought Eaten Back to Life, <laughs> I found this other gem, Butchered at Birth, which I still absolutely love this one. This one was even more deathy. Barnes' vocal register went down even lower. Like, he just sounded like some gnarly fucking monster. <laughs> and, you know, the song titles got even <laughs> nastier. I mean, Rancid Amputation, Vomit the Soul, which had a nice little guest spot from Glenn Benton, Meat Hook Sodomy. Fantastic. But yeah, like this once again cemented me as a Campbell Corpse fan and like really opened up <laughs> a lot of the whole death metal thing. Like it really couldn't get much more extreme than this when I was a at kid. At the time. At the yeah. time. <laughs> it would. But this is still an awesome gem, and I still jam this one pretty frequently. Black Dahlia Murder. Unhallowed. I'm pretty certain this is where it legitimately started for me. Um, as far as really wanting to explore into death metal. The song, Thy Horror Cosmic, is what did it for me. That driving double kick beat that's in that entire song is just brilliant. Uh, that's a, I think this is where Death Growl started for me. Just, yeah, just heavy, fast music, and, and I, I really think that, I, I really think, thanks Trevor, you know? I really think that Black Dolly Murders on Hollow is pretty much what did it for me. So... I knew a kid in high school that wore the t-shirt for this lovely album, Deicide's Once Upon the Cross, to school, and he became sort of a legend, a very low-level legend for being kicked <laughs> out of class, <laughs> and because he had a disemboweled Jesus on his shirt. Huh. And of course, I had to look up where this album came from, and lo and behold, I discovered an awesome death metal gem. Uh, this was their third album, and it's fucking killer from start to finish. Not my favorite Deicide album, but it's definitely up there. This really kind of pushed it with those super blasphemous lyrics. Like, I've never been a very religious person, but Jesus Christ, this guy went fucking nuts after it. And hearing the whole shit about Glenn Benton burning a fucking upside-down cross into his forehead and shit, like, this is 100% this is extreme as fuck. I don't think it will get heavier. I was wrong again. But another killer jam, still good. Check it out. All right, next in line. One of my favorite bands now of all time, Suffocation, and their album Souls to Deny. I guess most notably this record, I would never been to a death metal show ever until I went to go see um, Fear Factory play in a, in a venue that used to be around here called Peabody's in Cleveland, Ohio. Before that place closed, I saw probably 50 to 60 shows there but I went one night with a dude from high school to go see Fear Factory. And unbeknownst to me at the time were the other bands opening for Fear Factory. One was Decapitated, uh, and then next in line was Suffocation. And again, I, I'd never heard Suffocation. Um, I, I was actually there to see Fear Factory. I was a giant Fear Factory fan, you know, the Fear Factory machine head Pantera era, you know. Went there to see Fear Factory, and Suffocation took the stage and blew my fucking mind. 
Never seen anything like that. And in fact, since that time, I've seen Suffocation, what we've seen them now four or five times. The title track, Souls to Deny, um, Surgery of Impalement mm -hmm. is fucking amazing. Uh, Subconsciously Enslaved. I mean, all of Suffocation is just killer. But this this record, I mean, that I was, I was done at that point. I knew that death metal would be a, a soul staple in my life forever. Thanks, Frank. It was good to see you on your final tour. <laughs> Solid dude. Yep, great to meet you. Uh, okay, next in line. Well, it's funny you should bring up Fear Factory, because Fear Factory's Soul of a New Machine was unknowingly one of my early listens to death metal. I remember seeing Fear Factory at OzFest 97, and I was completely blown away by their sound. They squeezed in one song from this, I didn't recognize it, I was more blown away by the stuff on D-Manufacture, and I went and picked that up, and then I saw this right next to it, I was like, well, fuck, let's just get all their shit. And this one is notably different because this is technically their only death metal album. There's really nothing about their current sound on this. It is very straightforward, blast beat heavy, yeah. very groove, chuggy death metal. Yeah. There's barely any samples on this. And it's really good. It's a really underrated album as far as like earlier death metal. This came out in, I believe, 92. So, yeah. yeah, this was right in the heyday of that early death metal sound that was pretty much going all through fucking Florida. Another band, I, I guess, that helped me discover uh, definitely uh, heavier, faster death metal, um, even even grind chorus, and some people will say this definitely has some grindy moments to it, um, was Beneath the Massacre's first uh, album, which I guess would be an EP, but I'm going to count it anyway, because the, the song that got me into really brutal, heavy death metal would have been the song Nevermore off this album. Um, in fact, my phone for a long time after this record came out rang the the breakdown to uh, Beneath the Massacre's Nevermore. Heavy, fast, the drums on here are absolutely fucking insane. Uh, Justin Roussel, I believe, was the name of the original drummer on this album. Of course, their lead singer, who now is going to appear on... He appears on, oh, and the new Devin Townsend. Oh! The new Devin Townsend, the oh, lead shit. singer Beneath the Massacre, will appear on the new Devin Townsend uh, material. Um, it's just rallying all the Canadians. Yep, yep. This whole record, though, from back to front, if you're a fan of really brutal, heavy music, this whole album, there's not a song on here that's not fucking killer. Boy, Gatorade's good. <laughs> mm. Even though you're drinking Powerade. This is Powerade, but Gatorade's still good, too. <laughs> Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Grave. You'll never see. Now, I remember hearing about this band on Century Media samplers early on, like I think it, uh, Eyes of Death samplers, mm. or the, the first run of Century Media samplers that I got wind of. And this band was on there, and they were noticeably a fuck ton heavier than the other bands. Like, Century Media used to sign more of like the melodic death crowd, you know, keyboards, you know, yep. growl vocals, but they're mixing with cleans here and there, or symphonic stuff. These guys just stripped it down to its ugly, nasty roots and just made the heaviest shit possible loaded with fucking groove. And it's 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 still one of their best albums, in my opinion. And this got me into just kind of that Swedish sound, too. Like, I heard this long before I heard Entombed or Dismember, and this is pretty damn close to it. But yeah, I mean, the title track, Severing Flesh, great fucking jams in here. I still listen to this quite a bit, too. All right, next in line, a band I wish to this day was still around. I think these guys could have continued in their path and done definitely awesome things was uh, Into the Moat, The Design. So back in like 2005, again, when I was just starting to get into heavier music, I was jamming bands like Hatebreed and Killswitch Engage and Shadows Fall and Lamb of God. and These guys, again, were a MySpace find for me. Um, the opener track, Century 2, again, is just like a two and a half minute long instrumental. And it's got some, some polyrhythms to it. Um, but for the most part, it's just this big, open, like heavy, chuggy riff. And, and again, like I said, I was in that era of kind of like the metalcore, you know, Shadows Fall, Lamb of God, all that jazz. And I wanted something heavier, and Into the Moat came as a recommendation. And these guys, again... Heavy, fast, chuggy, mashuga esque Yes. For sure. Breakdown friendly. Um, break, <laughs> yeah, break, breakdown friendly, mashuga esque math metal, but definitely more just exploratory into another land of music. And the, again, the, the record 
in my opinion, for its time period, is pretty well produced. These guys definitely know how to play their instruments really well, and it's, again, it's really heavy, and it just, it, it sated my, my tastes for wanting to be into heavier music, so thank you Into the Moat. Wish you were still around. <laughs> well, this one's definitely still around. Nile and their Dark Enshrines. This is the first Nile album I ever picked up, and I remembered, like, I think I was pretty much just looking at different music publications and I was noticing that this one wasn't just in the metal publications like Spin did a review on this I think it may even squeaked in a rolling zone it was like okay there's obviously something about this album that's garnering a lot of attention and I decided to check it out and what I found were quite possibly some of the fastest blast beats I've ever heard insane guitar work and one thing that's super unique to them is this weird Egyptology theme that carries throughout and i just dug it i was like okay this is kind of heady subject matter and dude this music is insane i mean like one of my go-to favorites sarcophagus and i believe they still play this live too but yeah this this was probably one of the heaviest things i had ever picked up to this point in my you know musical searches yeah yeah, uh, I had heard I had heard a little bit of, of Black Seeds of Vengeance prior to, of course, this album, but at the time I wasn't into death metal yet, and it didn't it didn't jive with me yet. Yeah. <laughs> but but years later, yeah. it most definitely would. Years later, something happened, and this became one of the heaviest fucking albums I owned for a long time. Yep. Still, it's still ridiculously heavy and just super well done. Great album. All right, so again, I know I mentioned Mashuga as I was getting in, into heavier music. I, I definitely got into the kind of chuggy, genty uh, math core, you know, and, and another band that really did it for me. And in fact, to this day, I'm still a giant fan of these guys. And I wish they would tour in America, for fuck's sake, especially in the Midwest. You guys, I'm speaking directly to you, I and Dissonance, minus the herd. I can't say enough good things about this album. Uh, I mean, f most specifically, if you're a, a fan of Meshuga or Gent in general, not even not even necessarily talking about death metal, because I don't think they're death metal. I think they're definitely Gent. These guys were a catalyst for me, of course. This album kicks fucking assholes. There's a lot of hardcore fucking oh. like, it, like there's hardcore to it. Like the it's, yeah. it's fucking heavy. It it is it, angry. It it heavy and angry is all get out. Um, again, I, this would definitely be a catalyst for what brought me into heavier music. The guitar tones on there are disgusting. I, I, I dig the shit out of this album. Scornhaven, Neil, Through Evidence, You Shouldn't Be Alive, Shun Redeemer, Void of Consciousness. They're, every, every song on this album is killer. Heavier than shit. Again, it's stuff like this that made me know that I definitely wanted to be into heavier music, and it just, it, by the time I hit this point and the next couple records I'm going to mention, I was already pretty much sold. Sorry, I get excited. I love my innocence. <laughs> they should come to the States. Okay. Far be it for me to ever labor a point. <laughs> All right. When I was a kid, I honestly bought Obituary, World Demise here, just because the logo was cool. That was... Pretty much it. And then lo and behold, I found this awesome groovy death metal band. Now, honestly, this isn't even my favorite album. Ever. It's kind of farther back. But it was the one that got me started. I think I got these guys almost like immediately after I got into Cannibal Corpse. So this is technically my second love in death metal. And I still love them. I got to see them twice last year. It was incredible each time. And yeah, they, these guys just... They, it, it's I wouldn't say it's more accessible <laughs> than any other kind of death sure, metal, sure. but it, it is very groove laden and very head bangable. It's not all about blast beats and such. And <laughs> I, I dug the creepy atmosphere to it. Yeah. And yeah. like I said, they're a staple. Definitely check these guys out live. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for and most sure. of their discography is pretty good. All right. A band I never got to see live and will never get to see live Necrophages. Epitaph. I I heard this album and instantaneously fell in love. This was the coolest thing. I it's still to this day. There's what this was released in what oh four oh four oh four. Still to this day, this record is one of the coolest things I've ever heard, and I've yet to see anybody truly duplicate it. 
that is a tech metal master um, base. Yeah, and and many have tried, but nobody comes, in my opinion, close to what Necrophagus did for death metal. The sound of this album is just amazing, and and that's again, hearing something like that, you know, you kind of want to know what else is out there because with the way this sounded and how cool it was and just the the drums the guitar work everything in this album is amazing yeah that that was another yet for me just i wanted to know what else there was at that point i thought well fuck man if these guys are out there what the hell else is out there and well you brought up suffocation so my turn this is the first suffocation album i ever heard and honestly it's probably my favorite pierce from within thrones of blood quite possibly one of my absolute favorite songs by Suffocation. Now, the story goes, I went out to Colorado when I was 17. Uh, my mom sent me out there for, like, an archaeological camp or something like that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> That's weird, because when I went to Colorado at 17, I went to do drugs. But <laughs> Oh, I did drugs there. I totally did drugs. <laughs> but I also dug up Pueblo Indian shit when I wasn't doing drugs. Sure, sure. But I remember going there, and this is dude from California, and we were jamming metal, and I was playing like Obituary and Cannibal Corpse, mm-hmm, and I was like, mm-hmm. did you ever hear of Suffocation? I was like, no. And he showed me this CD and popped it in, and I was like, holy fuck, that might be the heaviest thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And instantly became a fan, but I didn't get any of their stuff until later, because like a stoner, when I was a teenager, I forgot. But sure. years later, got that again, and holy shit, this is such a great album. And... Uh, like I said, I, I think this is their best album, personally. That might change if we do a discography, but I doubt it. But yeah, this this is a staple for any death metal fan at all. S- suffocation, yeah. period, I think yeah. is a staple for any death metal fan. You know, I don't miss them when they come to town. No. Nope. All right. Uh, last but not least for me, and certainly these are in no order, obviously. Uh, Through the Eyes of the Dead, uh, Malice. Uh, again, this record was killer-heavy. Super fast. Drummer of that band was amazing. I, I had heard at the time very few drummers that could kick with the speed that he kicked. The guitars were amazing. The vocals on this record were done by a, a dude named Nate. From he, our hometown. Yeah, from our hometown, from Toledo, Ohio. He was in a band called Premonitions of War. And I've met him before, super nice guy. But the vocals he brought to this record, if you ever listened to Through the Eyes of the Dead before Malice and even after Malice, because they house different singers on every record, in my opinion, the vocals on Malice were about as heavy as they got. Nate, yeah. Nate really brought a really deep, guttural, heavy death growl. Even though it's deathcore, it made it more death metalish. And so, again... It trips on that boundary. It was pretty close yep, to death. Yep. <coughs> um, but the, the title track on this album, Malice... As good as dead, really. If you go to if you go to a, a bar with an internet jukebox, play songs up this album. You'll clear out a bar real quick. <laughs> he and I do it all the time. It's fun. We go shoot pool. We'll... Let's go scare the fucking straights. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got one more, and this one is a compilation that I got when I was probably sixteen. I miss 15. compilations. Yeah, these they they these things are a rarity them. now. So if you can find these, they're kind of cool. Uh, this is At Death's Door 2. This was put out by Roadrunner Records in 1993. And on this was pretty much a platter of stupid, awesome heavy metal. We had Fear Factory's Martyr was on here, Disincarnate, Suffocation, Cynic Gorguts, Death, Malevolent Creation, Immolation. Just tons of death metal and <laughs> how could I not put this on there? Because this was actually a gateway into so many other different mm-hmm. bands for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it may not be a studio album by one band, but oh my god, there's so much stuff in here. And I, I like I said, this this one was big for me, branching out past the ones I had already had. Mm-hmm. And I got it for probably three bucks in a bargain bin, so that's pretty damn cool. You know, get Spotify, dig as deep as you can. Yeah. This is what got us into death metal. You know, God only knows what's going to get you into death metal. But really, dig for it. Thanks for watching once again. Yeah, for sure. And like, subscribe, all that jazz. And uh, we're probably going to make more of these videos. Catch you guys later.